now, yes, those people that were buying the dip, now you should have been plowing everything you had into there. And if you did it because you got scared, then this shows why you, why you don't buy the dip because it's really tough. But so that's the simple equation. You just figure out, okay, how much upside do we need to get back to even, to get back to like our, our new all-time high? And then take that and divide by the number of years you expect. And that's roughly the percentage yield you would have going forward. So in this case, with 50%, five years, like a 10% um, gain. Even if it took 10 years, you're getting 5% gains, which is not bad. But I mean, it's not, that's obviously not great. It's much lower than the market average. But you can just kind of guess from there that it really reframes how you think about a crash. And Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Lockerbie. And like I said at the top, I am here with Nick Majuli to talk about your new book. Welcome. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. So as I just mentioned, you have a new book. It's called Just Keep Buying, which I just love that. Proven ways to save money and build your wealth. There are two main sections of this book, the first of which is on saving and the second is on investing. And you just gave a wonderful interview on our Millennial Investing Show where you covered a lot of the topics in the book related to personal finance and saving and how much to save, et cetera. So I'm going to recommend everyone interested in that to go check out Millennial Investing episode 157. And I'm going to try and focus this discussion on more of the back half of the book where we're talking about investing. One of the best aspects of this book, in my opinion, is that you debunk a lot of myths, mostly around personal finance, but also around investing. For instance, it's a common misconception that you should try to, let's say, max out your 401k, if at all possible which makes sense because it's more about time in the market versus timing the market, right? But you have a different opinion here. So I want to kick it off by you telling us a little bit about why we might not want to max out our 401k. Yeah. So if, if you had asked, I mean, most personal finance experts, I'd say 10 out of 10 would have told you max out your 401k. It's something I've heard my whole life. I used to say that myself, but then I just, you know, I ran the numbers, did a little simulation where I said, how much tax savings are you getting in one of these non-taxable accounts? Like let's say a Roth 401k versus just, you know, doing a well-managed brokerage account where you're not day trading or anything like that and getting a bunch of taxes. And what I found is that the annual benefit is about, you know, 0.73% a year. So 73 BIPs, we'll, just, we'll call it 0.7%, 70 BIPs just to make this a round number. And that's not a huge benefit that there, that is something there, but that's before even looking at differences in fees. So... If you're the fees in your 401k plan, because you can't really select your investments necessarily, you got to pick from what they give you. If you're all in fees or, you know, 1% or, you know, you could say, you know, say 0.7%, 70 bips, then there's no benefit at all to doing it compared to like a brokerage account. Right. And so there's simple things like that when I was like, wow, this is not maybe great for everybody. And so I think I'm just trying to raise awareness around this problem because I don't think it's right for everyone. And I think I probably put too much into retirement savings early. And I think everyone should, you know, go all the way to the match, get the full match. It's free money. Definitely do that. But everything above the match is the question. And so for some people, like if that's their only way to save, then do it. You got to max, right? If you can't, if you have no discipline outside, you have to max, right? It's a good behavioral crutch. But for the people that are a little bit more disciplined, can put money in their brokerage account, know to invest that way. I think you should just run the numbers and see how much am I actually paying for my 401k all in, not just the fees of the funds, but the fees associated with the 401k itself. Once you get all those numbers, you can say like, wow, I'm actually paying, maybe I'm paying more than I thought. And so it doesn't necessarily make sense to max this when that money, I have to lock it up to 59 and a half. So you lose a lot of flexibility and you may be, you know, losing money relative to just a brokerage account. So those are the things I would just think about. And so obviously the, the chapter goes into more depth with the mathematics and all that, but that's kind of the, the high level thing. It's not right for everyone, you know? And so those people that are in high tax states now, they're going to be low tax states in retirement. Yes, it probably makes sense to, to max, you know, but that's not necessarily true for everybody. So just the one take I have there. I appreciate that. And that's one of the parts I love about the book is all the data that's presented. And you just brought up the tax element. So I kind of want to cover that quickly around Roth versus non-Roth. You have Roth IRAs, even Roth 401ks. Where do you stand on the sideline? Where do you stand on the argument around Roth to Roth or not to Roth? Yeah, so to Roth or not to Roth, there's a lot of factors. And this is why I, I really, it's my least favorite thing to discuss is taxes because everything is based on personal situation. Like a lot of things in investing, you can kind of generalize to people, but everything is based on your personal situation. So, you know, if you're young and you you're, you know you're gonna make a lot more later, then it's probably better to Roth early and then switch to pre-tax later in life. 
Um, if you know tax rates are going to go up in retirement, then you're probably going to want to Ross now, right? But you don't know that, right? I thought tax rates would only be going up throughout my life. And then the 2017 Act cut taxes. So I was like, what? You know, it's kind of like wild to think that, but that's what happened. So it's hard to predict the future. That's one thing. But yeah, so I'd say, and you can do both. Like I actually think both is a great solution because you have a little bit of flexibility. You can kind of pick and choose what you want to do. And, and technically anyone doing a Roth, if you're getting a match, that match is in a traditional, like that match is not post-tax. That's pre-tax money that your employer is probably putting away. So because of that, anyone who's doing a Roth and getting a match is technically doing both without realizing it. So doing both is probably my, my go-to. One other thought there about colleges, you, you talk about how college is generally better than not having college, especially for your income and your book. What about a 529, for example, you're putting money into your kid's account, letting it grow to use that money for college say 18 years later or so, when you talk about the cost of college in the book, one thing that I don't think was covered was just the increase, the kind of inflation of college just in the last, I think 20 years, it's up something like 500%. We can fact check that in a minute. But what about the cost of college outpacing the investment that you're putting into that 529 over time? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I mean, that's definitely a problem, right? That's been happening. And I think, I don't think costs can keep going up forever because at some point, especially I think COVID really opened people's eyes to this. Like, wait, I'm paying the same amount and I'm getting a digital class. Like it's the experience is completely different, right? So I think that can't go on forever. I do think credentials still matter to some degree, but the question of which ones and which colleges are going to see those effects, I think you're going to maybe won't see that at like the top schools, but you will probably see that at schools that are maybe that are super expensive, but they're like obviously lower tier. They don't have the same job placement as maybe other places. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing too, is I think the future of work is going to change a little bit in the sense of there's a lot of, I think that, you know, people thinking about, you know, things like income sharing agreements. So if you go, I don't know if you've heard of Lambda school, but they have this model where like, we train you, you don't pay anything, but then once you get a job, you basically owe us X dollars and you pay us out of your paycheck until, so it's like you're taking a loan, but you're just, you only, you only pay it off if you get a good paying job, right? So it's like, it's conditional. Like the incentives are aligned in the right way versus college. It's like, you've already paid me. I don't care what happens to you. I mean, they care in terms of the prestige, but in theory, they don't have to care about any individual, but with an income sharing agreement, which some people don't like for various reasons. I actually like it a little bit because it's like, hey, th the incentives are aligned. Like they, there's every incentive for like a Lambda school to go out there and get you the highest paying job because they want to make, you know, their 18%. And so th they want to maximize that number as high as possible, right? They want to get your income as high as possible. So they make more. So I kind of like that idea. And I think stuff like that will start happening more in the future and we'll kind of have to see how it plays out. Yeah, universities do the exact opposite of, right? As soon as you go make more money, they come after you for more money. <laughs> give them more donations, more yeah. donations, right? Yeah, exactly. um, so whether it be a 401k through your company or even a 529, you are essentially dollar cost averaging into that portfolio. And this makes sense because you're capturing different prices over time and hopefully taking advantage of when the market experiences a large correction. However, talk to us about how you might not want to use that same strategy if you were to say, have a windfall of capital that you want to invest. So I'm actually going to argue that that is the same strategy. When you get, when you, so when you're buying your 401k, like let's say every two weeks, you don't take that money, let's say 4%, let's say you put 4% in your company matches. You don't take that 4% and then slowly spread it out. You put it in right away. So if you had a big windfall and you sold a company, got inheritance, whatever, you let's say you have $100,000. I would argue if you put that money to work right away, you're, you're behaving the same as if you're behaving your 401k, right? You're putting it to work immediately instead of what I call averaging in. I call that in the book, averaging it. Now people do call that dollar cost averaging as well, but as you can see, that's very different. If you have hundred K and you slowly add it into the market, that's very different than what you're doing in your 401k, which are like these miniature lump sum payments that you're making every two weeks. So I would say like the, the first term of dollar cost average, which is buying over time. I think that is still valid, but really what you're doing, you're buying as soon as you have the money or you're investing as soon as you have the money. And so I think that is the strategy. That's what matters most is like getting invested sooner. And if you're worried about like market volatility and stuff, then it's probably a risk issue. Maybe you're investing in something too risky and you need to kind of de-risk a little. So, But Nick, I'm saving so that when the market inevitably tanks, I can back up the truck and buy everything at a discount, right? So talk to us. But just talk to us about the pitfalls of trying to time the market in that way, especially the quote unquote, buy the dip strategy. 
Yeah. So that strategy, um, it can work obviously, but there's a lot of, most of the time it doesn't because, you know, most markets, most of the time are going up and to the right, you know, and that's, that's the problem, right? So the, the simple, the simple example I can give is like at the beginning of 2017, I had written a post called just keep buying, which became basically the intro and, you know, planted the seed for what became this book eventually. And in, it was early 2017. I remember some of the comments I got were like, oh, valuations are too high. We can't be buying right now. Market's going to crash. You know, the same old stuff that I always heard. And sometimes they'll be right. But like, even if you had stayed on the market or holding cash then, and you waited until the absolute minimum, you know, the absolute, the lowest point we had in March, 2020, which was March 23rd, and you went till the market was down 33% and you put all your cash in then, you still would have bought at a price that was 7% higher than you would have bought in 2017. Like we just bought earlier. So the issue is these dips occur. But a lot of times they happen and that that even to the lowest point they get to is higher than what you could have bought originally, right? So most of these dips that happen, they dip to a price that's still higher than what you could have gotten, you know, if you're just invested at the beginning. So that's the real issue with buying the dip is people wait in cash. And so even if you get it right once, you're going to get it wrong later. So it's not the, it's not, it's like a, it's something that kills you slowly, not, not quickly, right? So buying the dip, you're like, oh, wow, I'm not going to experience a market crash by doing that. That's true. But at the same time, there's going to be some point in the future when you're sitting in cash for years and the market's just rallying upward and you missed out big and that's when it gets you. So if it doesn't happen right away, you might've gotten lucky once, it's going to get you eventually. Anyone with like a 40, 50 year time horizon is going to underperform relative to someone who's just buying every single month. You mentioned the low of that COVID crash being around March 23rd. And there is this beautiful moment in your book when the world was collapsing on the on that day, I think March 22nd or March 23rd. And you witnessed something that gave you a sense of normalcy and relief. And I'd love for you to share that story and what you learned from it, because quite honestly, it feels like a memory for me now after reading it. And it's something (laughs) I think that I'll actually think about and draw on the next time we experience something like that. Yeah. So it was March 22nd, which was the Sunday, the 23rd, which I didn't know was the bottom at the time, obviously was the next Monday, but it was on that Sunday. And I was in New York City, it was in Manhattan. And so I was basically ground zero for like all the COVID attention, everything was happening. The city was empty, it was crazy. And I remember going to the grocery store, like every Sunday morning, I'd get my groceries. And there's a, there's a fairway in Murray Hill. And I went, went over to like, there's like a, you enter on the ground level and there's like an escalator going down into the atrium of the store. And as I'm going down the escalator, I see like, there's a man, there's always flowers at the bottom. And this man was arranging flowers. And I was, I remember I had gotten texts like friends, what's going to happen? What's going on next? Everyone's panicking, panic, panic, panic. And there's this guy just arranging flowers. Like if I had walked in, if you just walked in and seen that, like ignore the shelves, ignore, like there's no canned goods. There's no flour, ignore all that. And all the meat sections gone, right? Ignore all that stuff. And if you had just walked in that day, you would have thought nothing weird was happening. The man was arranging flowers like anything else. And it was just this moment of normalcy for me that I was like, I think things are going to be okay. Like I'm not hundred percent sure, obviously, but there's like this, I don't know. It kind of just gave me a little bit of like, I was a little like, okay, we'll recover from this. Obviously, like if this guy thinks like the audacity of it, right? Like to sell flowers right now, like to still think like this guy wasn't bothered, like, you know, and so I was like, okay, there's something there. And so, I don't know, it gave me a little bit of optimism in that moment. It was when it was pretty dark. So yeah, I remember you writing, you know, who needs flowers? I need toilet paper, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I need toilet paper and canned goods. And there were out of, goods. all of those things. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, there is a, a, a cool equation you lay out here in the book by estimating time for the market to recover after one of these large dips, you can actually come up with your expected yield. And I found this really fun. It's kind of a back of the napkin kind of equation, so to speak, so to speak. So if you wouldn't mind, walk us through the equation. You don't have to go through it necessarily literally, but just the essentials of how it works and calculate to calculate your expected return if the market is to go down and you expect it to recover. Like you see the guy arranging flowers and you say, everything's going to be okay. Yeah. Okay. So the, the example I'll give is, well, let's just use the March 2020, you know, the March 23rd, 2020 correction, right? At that point, the market was down about 33%, right? So if the market's down 33% and you can do this mathematically. So let's say it started, the market started at hundred dollars to make this easy. It drops to 66, right? So to get back to hundred, how big of a gain do you need? Do you need a 50% gain, right? It's half of 66 is 33, 30 to 30 plus 66 is basically hundred, right? So it's down, down 33, you need a 50% gain, right? So my question is, how long do you think it's going to take the market to recover? That's the only piece of information I need from you. Once I have that, I can back out what you just called the expected yield. So if you think it's going to take five years, and you know there's a 50% upside, 
I mean, this is not the exact math. I'm just doing this linearly to make this simple, but let's say 50% divided by five years, you're basically guessing about a 10% return for you, which is pretty good. I mean, if you actually do the math on that, you know, five, you know, 1.5 to the one fifth power, it's like 8.5% or something. So it's, it's not as high as I said, it's, you know, cause of compounding, but just get my point. I'll just, just do a linear extrapolation because it's easier. So imagine you think, oh, I think the market's going to recover in two years. Okay. Then that's 25% a year. Do you not want 25% a year right now? And so I looked at this and I was, I thought the market would take two to three years to recover. And I'm looking at the data and I'm just like, wow, even then, like, these are, this is a great time to buy. Like, I wish I had more cash. Like, I don't, because I invested it already, right? So now, yes, those people that were buying the dip, now you should have been plowing everything you had into there. And if you did it because you got scared, then this shows why you, why you don't buy the dip because it's really tough. But so that's the simple equation. You just figure out, okay, how much upside do we need to get back to even, to get back to like our, our new all-time high? And then take that and divide by the number of years you expect. And that's roughly the percentage yield you would have going forward. So in this case, with 50%, five years, like a 10% um, gain. Even if it took 10 years, you're getting 5% gains, which is not bad. But I mean, it's not, that's obviously not great. It's much lower than the market average. But you can just kind of guess from there that it really reframes how you think about a crash in, in a fundamental way. Um, yeah. But and the, the funny part, one last thing. What actually happened, the market was back at all time highs within six months. So like on an annualized basis, like 106% annualized return or something just absurd, which should not be normal. So, But Nick, everyone comes at you after you say something like that and says, well, what about Japan, right? They had this huge crash. They've never recovered. They've never gotten to all time highs. It's been 20 plus years. What do you say to folks like that? Well, this is, this is why we diversify, right? And also like there's a, there's a couple of things. There's two problems with that argument. First thing is like, yes, if you put all your money, if you sold a business in Japan in 1988 and you put all of your money in one lump sum payment in 1989, it's Japanese equities only. Yes, you're the unluckiest investor in human history, probably up there, right? So like, that's bad. But if you diversified, if you had some money elsewhere, if you were buying over time, that's the second argument. If you're buying over time, it's very different. And I show in the book in chapter 17, I say, pick someone who's putting just a dollar into the market, up through 89, the crash happens. And yes, there are times when they're above their cost basis, which means they made money and there's time when they're below what they've invested, where they've lost money, right? And if you do that over 30 years and like, yeah, the return wasn't great, I'm not going to lie, but you still probably made a little bit of money on that if you had just done it, even despite the fact that Japan hasn't had a recovery after by the end of 2020, right? So the, the thing I say is get diversified. And if you're buying over time, that get de-risks a lot of these things here. So that, that's the thing I would say to people, like, yes, it happens, but get diversified and buy over time and you kind of get rid of a lot of that risk. All right, so we focus a lot on picking stocks on this show. And personally, I'm a believer that it's possible to beat the market, but that the average person, you know, shouldn't spend that much energy or focus attempting it because it's probably not even necessary for their goals. That said, I personally love the art and science of picking stocks because it's kind of like solving a puzzle. You, found, you find this diamond in the rough and you unlock this value if you did your job correctly, right? But these are just my personal opinions. Talk to us about the actual data and the case maybe against picking stocks. Yeah, so there's basically two arguments and I'm assuming most of your audience has heard the first argument. So I'll just summarize that briefly. I call that the financial argument or the performance argument. And that argument basically says over any three to five year period, most stock pickers, active managers, whatever you want to call them, don't beat their benchmark. Don't beat like the market after fees, right? So you look at, and there's the, the reports are called the SPIVA reports, S-P-I-V-A, SPIVA. Look them up. You can look at any equity market around the world. And it's like somewhere between 60 to 80% of managers will not beat their benchmarks. They just can't do it. It's tough to do, right? And so most people know that argument. So, hey, this is why you shouldn't pick stocks because you probably won't beat the market, right? Now, the second argument, which I think is the better argument is, how do you know if you're good at stock picking? I call this the existential argument, right? So if you want to put 5% of your money, whatever, even 10% of your money into individual stocks and do it, go ahead, have fun with it, right? I don't care about that. I'm talking to the people that are like, you know, most of their wealth is in individual stocks and, and picks. And the reason I say that is because how do you know if you're good? And they, they did not studies where they, they show there is skill. There are people that can beat the market. I'm not debating that, but they think it's about 10%. There have been studies that have done 10, maybe 15%. So let's just say 10% of people can beat the market. They have skill, known skill. Let's also assume we can identify people who are really bad at it, right? The, the bottom 10%. That means the, the top 10 of the bottom 10 are gone. So that means we have 80% of people, four out of five people picking stocks have no idea if they're good. And that's my thing to you is like, how are you going to play this game where you don't know if you're good at it? Like if in almost any endeavor in life, you know if you have skill pretty quickly. And the, the example I give is like, 
if you went onto the the basketball court with LeBron James, and let's say we didn't know who LeBron James was, he was just like good, but he was secretly good, knowing who he was, you would know within minutes, like you don't play basketball like this guy played basketball, right? You would just know he has skill. If you went and sat down with like a famous computer programmer, you know, and you tried to write a computer program, like they would just beat you, you know, or something like that. Like you would know who has skill and who doesn't. But with stock picking, you can't know. Like you and I can pick stocks and we can wait a year. And if you beat me, does that mean you're better or does that mean you're lucky? And you don't know. And and anyone who's telling you otherwise, you you can't know. And you have to take a really long time. You need a sufficient sample size. Like how long does it take? Five years, 10 years before you know if you're good? And my other counters, even if you are good, like there's a Bayard study that went out, like even the best top performing money managers have periods of underperformance. The best people who we know have skill have periods of, of unlucky underperformance. And so that's the kind of issue. It's like, you have to sit there and grind through all that, not know if you're good at it. And then like, wake up, look yourself in the mirror every day and like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm just going to keep doing this, even though I don't know if I'm good at it. Right. It's just, that messes with me internally. And obviously some people enjoy it and that's fine. If you enjoy it, do your thing. But if you're one of those people who's on the fence, like, why am I doing this? You probably need to really reconsider. So that's my argument. Just the existential argument, I think is more important than the performance one. So that's my secret. I just tell myself I'm good, right? <laughs> this good. So uh, anyway, I, I think that's a really fascinating argument that you laid out there. Not only I, I have heard the first one, but that second one I haven't heard before. And I think that's a really interesting point. And it, it reminds me of, you know, why Jimmy Fallon got out of the movie business. He, at one point he said, you know, I have to make this movie and then wait a year or two years for it to be released to know if it was bad or not, because you have no control after you act in it, how it's actually going to turn out. It's actually kind of similar in investing. Hmm. Um, one piece of investing that we don't quite cover, I think enough on this show is real estate investment trusts. And in theory, these should be an exciting product for most investors, but I hardly hear any investors actually investing in them. So why should we focus in on REITs as they're called? And what are some of the ways to identify the best ones? Yeah, so I, I'm not a real estate expert. I'm not going to be able to tell you how to find the best REITs out there. I just try and find ones that are like, you know, broad based market owned commercial properties, things like that. But the reason I own REITs is just because I don't want to deal with owning investment properties. And that's a personal preference. I know people that are, that love doing that, love owning properties. They've earned great returns. You can actually, I think, earn higher returns when you own the physical property than you can buying it through a REIT because there's no management fee and all that, but you have to do more stuff for it. You know, there's more, you know, upkeep for that. Um, so my personal thing is like, I want real estate exposure, but I don't want to deal with it. So I do REITs. That's kind of my thing. So that's, if I'm going to just talk about REITs, that's the only thing I'm going to say on that. And there's different ways of doing REITs. Like I just buy them publicly, but there's, I know there's like private REITs and things like that you can get into. There's a lot of online resources. I don't want to plug anybody, but you can, you can Google that and figure it out. Um, but yeah, that's all I have to say on real estate. I just think it's, it's nice to have that exposure. And if you, if you want to get exposure without having to deal with all the headaches of actually having tenants or, you know, oh, a pipe burst, all that stuff. I know people talk about pipe burst stuff. And maybe it doesn't happen as often. Like that's like a horror story, but um, for me, it's just like, you know, I just want a hassle-free way to earn some uh, differentiated, you know, return stream from stocks. I think that's a great point um, because rental property is often referred to as almost like the safest bet to earn some cash flow and get some appreciation, hopefully over time from the property itself while people are living in it and paying it off for you. But those issues, I think, are underappreciated and the time uh, required to actually, you know, manage that investment is a little bit underappreciated as well. I, it, you know, I have a brother-in-law at one point who I was really interested in buying some apartment complex and I'm running a business day to day. And he's like, look, what if you had to leave one of your meetings and go and fix like an oven, right? That isn't working. You know, you're going to make on a dollar basis, right? That time exchange where you're compounding wealth in one business. And yet you're going over here to maybe make some, a few dollars, right? Uh, ultimately on the cash flow side, it just didn't make sense. And I think not a lot of people appreciate that element of rental property enough. What are, would you say that's the biggest misconception when it comes to rental properties? Yeah, I think I would say like, that's probably the biggest one, but then at the same time, like there's more to it. Like, I, I think you need to talk to real estate experts about this. And I'm not just trying to give a cop out. Like, I don't want to talk about rental properties in the same way because I don't know as much. I never owned a rental property, right? So, I, I mean, the guys I you know trust on this is like the guys at How To Money. 
like they, they know that listen to that podcast, they're really good. They know about rental properties and I was speaking with them about this as well. So, um, yeah, I would just kind of, I would think about that a little bit, but you know, I would just get deeper into the space. I'm just saying, if you're someone who's like, I know for sure, I don't want to deal with that. Then REITs are the way like that's, and I know, cause I've had, I'm very biased against real estate and I know I'm biased. So I know I'm never going to probably be one of these people that has a bunch of investment properties. Cause I just, I have biases from 08 and I saw what happened to my parents and we don't have to go into all that. But in addition to that, like, I don't like the hassle. Like I like having to still get up and, oh, I got my, whatever, I get my little dividend payment from the REIT. That's great. I'd rather just get that and go on with my life, you know? Did you know we have an awesome free investing newsletter in addition to this podcast? We have over 30,000 people reading the newsletter daily. So some of you are subscribed, but that's a lot fewer than the 100 million podcast downloads we've done since inception. If you're one of the 99 million people who have listened to our podcast, but haven't yet subscribed to our newsletter, join for free today by simply clicking the link here on the pop-up on your screen and then entering your email. In just five minutes a day, you can stay up to date with what's going on with your money and in the financial world. Join over 30,000 other readers now by simply clicking the link here in the pop-up on your screen and then entering your email. Yeah, I think in general, your position here, here in the book is, you know, indexes, low costs, low maintenance, right? And make it mm -hmm. simple. And sometimes that's the best advice because if you start to overcomplicate it, you either may not actually stick to the system and uh, it could hurt your returns over time. And speaking of hurting returns over time, you also lay out a case in the book for bonds. And this was particularly interesting to me, especially things like the 60, 40 allocation of what have you, do you lay out a lot of cool data in the book about it, but this day and age, a 30 year bond is yielding two and a half percent. And you know, today eight, inflation is 8%. So you're, you're losing in real terms, money guaranteed. It's hard to justify owning bonds in times like these. So lay out the case for us as to why we should still consider bonds as part of our portfolio. Yeah. So I, I agree right now. It's, it's probably the toughest it's ever been for bonds because yields are low. Inflation's high. Like you're, you are losing money on owning bonds, but, um, the, the real, I mean, I guess the, my favorite quote about owning bonds comes from William Birdstein. We don't own bonds for the return on capital, but for the return of capital, which is basically like. You know, we're trying, it's a risk. It's all about risk, right? If you're trying to like grow your wealth to maximize your wealth as much as possible, yes, you should not own any bonds, but you're going to take a lot more risk by, by not owning bonds. So the, the question now is, is the 60, 40, does that need to become like a 75, 25, you know, stock bond mix in order to get you, you know, cause you don't have yield, but you don't want to be losing as much money. So you move to something like that. I don't know. But now that means that retirees or people in those types of portfolios are taking a lot more risk without realizing, and the market has been doing well for a long time, even despite the COVID crash, but there will be another crash at some point and it'll be really rough for those people that are, you know, 75, 25 instead of 60, 40. So I think generally bonds are, and you know, when things go bad, bonds hold up a little well, you know, and of course they can sell off, they even sold off a little bit in during, um, during the COVID crash, but they didn't sell off even as close to as much as stock. So that's really, yeah, it's risk. It's all risk, right? It's risk all the way down. So, um, yeah, if you're like, oh, I don't want to own bonds and how else are you de-risking? You know, do you have more cash? What are you going to do? I mean, cash is just going to lose you. I mean, you're losing less in bonds and you're losing in cash because you're getting some yield, right? Versus no yield. So very interesting. Yeah. I'm curious if you, you know, part of the inflation, we just talked about that 8%, that's the CPI number, right? But there's a, a, a level of debasement to the currency happening. That's never really been seen before over, you know, 60% of our currency was created in the last few years. And we are running these huge deficits, let's say here in the US. So running, you know, rebalancing our budget doesn't seem realistic anytime soon. And I'm kind of curious about if you buy into the case against bonds for the sole reason of not only is that interest rate low, but why is the interest rate low? Well, it's because we have too much debt as a country, right? We're losing somewhat of a credit worthiness uh, over time and paying even our citizens and other countries back in dollars that are cheaper than they were when we offered it to you. So not only is there inflation, there's that debasement element to it as well. Do you factor that in when you're talking about these uh, portfolio allocations? Yeah, so I don't try and care too much about what the Fed's doing. I know there's a lot of day traders that all they care about is what the Fed's doing here and there. And I try not to worry about those things. Obviously, if there's some major event where there's like hyperinflation or something else, 
Usually that's caused by something else going on in the country. It's not necessarily just monetary actions, at least historically, most times of hyperinflation of societal collapse, something else happened and then the, then the currency goes last, right? So I'm not too worried about things like that. Um, the other thing too is I think, so I actually have a very different take on interest rates. I think interest rates are low because we've actually de-risked a lot of the world. And what do I, what do I mean when I say that? Like, if you actually look at like hit interest rates for the last few hundred years, they've just been on a slow, slow decline over like the last few hundred years, like globally, right? And so what's happened, that's why most debt around the world is why is it all negative yielding? Because like people are probably going to pay back, right? The whole point of an interest rate is a measure of risk, right? Like if one person's not going to pay me back and I think they're not going to pay me back or one group of people is not going to pay me back, I'm going to charge them more than another group of people who I think is going to pay me back, vice versa, right? And so as we've kind of, we've de-risked systems, I think we have in a lot of ways, I'm not saying there's no risk left, but so that'd be silly, but you know, we don't have to worry about, you know, necessarily, I haven't, I don't think we're going to worry about bread lines like there were in the great depression. I think we have so much food. We have an obesity crisis, not a crisis of shortage, right? So I think, yes, there are shortages of things happening now with certain types of materials, but you know, society generally, I think is getting less, is, is de-risking, like children are living longer, people are living longer, right? Like all these sorts, so you look at all these measures, like humanity is improving a lot of good and big ways. I think that's why like interest rates have come down in some way. That's my take. And, you know, I'm not sure if it's completely right, but I'm throwing it out there. So it's interesting. No, it is interesting. And it's, it's, it's easy to get myopic here in the U.S. and think only about U.S. dollars. I was just talking to a friend literally this morning. He's from Iran and he said, you know, 30 years ago or so, the Iranian currency was a seven to one exchange with the U.S. dollar. And today it's 35,000 to one, right? So. Other countries are seriously uh, seeing inflation um, much beyond what we're seeing here in the U.S. So it's interesting to get that kind of perspective uh, every now and then. But part of your bond argument here is that they are good for rebalancing a portfolio. And rebalancing is something I just really have never been able to implement systematically in my portfolio. But I understand, you know, in theory, why it's so good. What is a good playbook for rebalancing a portfolio so that you can actually stick to it. You know, how often and how much? Yeah. So the, the short answer is I do it once a year because it coincides with tax season, right? So if you're rebalancing, you have to sell something in one of your brokerage accounts, you have to pay taxes. You know, that's not great. I, I try to, I say minimize selling, right? The book's called just keep buying for a reason. So, um, so they've, they've studied this and they said, okay, rebalancing stock bond, rebalancing, it doesn't matter if you do it twice a year, four times a year, or, you know, once a year, once every two years, they basically say there's no one period that always dominates. There's a lot of random luck and noise there. Right. And that's even true if you're rebalancing across risk assets. So William Bernstein, who I brought up earlier, he did an analysis like balancing equity, different equities, like global equities and U S equities. He found that no one rebalancing period dominates. So there's no one best answer. So I say, just do it once for tax season. And I really think the best way to rebalance, which I talk about in the book, is, is what I call an accumulation rebalance. So instead of actually selling one asset and buying more of another, over time as you're buying, you have to kind of like every, maybe every quarter or something, or you know, maybe halfway through the year, you just say, hey, where's my asset allocation today? And where was it at the beginning of the year? And kind of what are my targets? And if you're off, if one asset has too much relative to another, you just buy more of the underweight asset to try and get it back to even, right? You just you put your new funds, you kind of direct the new funds into the underweight thing so that it kind of gets back to even. So imagine you have too much stocks and not enough bonds by mid year, you would just say, okay, instead of sending my, you know, 60, 40, whatever, 60% of my new money to stocks and 40% to bonds, I may send 80% to bonds and 20% to stocks or hundred percent to bonds until I get it closer. And then I go back to 60, 40, something like that. There's different ways you can do this. And obviously you can't do that forever. At some point, once your portfolio is so large, you're not going to have enough income to offset just random changes in the market. But yeah, so that's the only time I, that's one of the things like rebalancing for me is important just because like, I think, you know, if you have set some risk level, you have some idea of how much risk you want to take. You kind of, if you don't rebalance stocks will basically, you know, if they keep continue to perform where they have historically stocks lead up your entire portfolio over 30 years, like 30 years from now, you're, you could be 60, 40 by the end, you're 95, five bonds or stocks and bonds. So. On that point right there, I mean, part of me thinks, well, what's so bad about that, right? Because especially with inflation where it is, and if you continue to believe it, it, it might not be transitory. What's your general take on stocks and how they absorb inflation? Are you, do you believe in that? Or have you seen that in the data? Um, is that a better allocation to weight into during times of high inflation? Yeah. So equities, generally global equities have done very well because businesses usually can pass those on to consumers. And we're seeing that now, like 
you know, my Chipotle bowl is $15 now in New York City. So, I mean, it's cheaper in other places, but you'll see prices are going up. And as the input prices go up, they just raise prices across the board and we all kind of pay into that inflation, right? So um, generally equities will rise with inflation. There's tons of data showing this. Um, I've, I've written pieces on this and yeah, you can, you can look this up, but I generally recommend equities. The other thing too, I mean, I, I don't recommend this, but this is an option. If you think inflation is going to stay high forever, if you like knew oh, inflation is going to be high, like 8% a year for the next five years. Another thing is like take out debt to like buy physical real estate because you can take out your debt and guess what? Your payment's fixed, but you're paying back, assuming you can capture some of that inflation, you're paying back in depreciated dollars, right? So that payment's fixed, but over time in real terms, it's, it's going smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's one of the benefits. Anyone who bought real estate in like, you know, 2017, 2019 is probably feeling pretty good right now, not only because prices are up, but because inflation's so high that their payment's not moving. They don't have to pay more. They, they don't experience the inflation, right? So. A minute ago, you talked about when to sell and that it shouldn't be very often, right? The book is called Just Keep Buying for a Reason. Mm -hmm. uh, people often think that finding the right stock to invest in is the hardest part of investing. But in fact, I would argue that it's actually knowing when to sell the stock. So walk us through a few scenarios for when we should actually consider selling out of a position. Yeah, so I think there's there's three cases. Uh, one, which I just mentioned, is rebalancing. So if you're doing a normal rebalance and you know, one of your assets just shot up a ton in price. Like I had Bitcoin, I bought Bitcoin a long time ago when it was like 8,000, shot up to 52. So it like went up to like, you know, my target allocation for it went up like two or three X. And I was like, this is way beyond. So I sold because not because it, any, I didn't care about the price just because like, Hey, I have a certain amount of risk I want to take. Right. So if I, if that keeps eating up my entire portfolio, you know, there's a lot more risk there. So rebalance is one. Another one is if you're in a concentrated position, like let's say you've been working in a company for a long time, you've been getting stock options and then you leave the company. And you're like, oh, I need to get out of this. It's okay to sell. Question of how much and not, I discuss that a little bit in the book. Um, and then the third thing would be um, if you just need to fund your lifestyle, like, like that's the point, right? The point of, I'm not saying, oh, just get money just to get money. No, like the whole point of this is so you can live the life you want to live, right? Now, ultimately that's the, that's the end goal. So yes, it's okay to sell. Like I, I'm saying it's okay. So I know the book called Just Keep Buying, but there are times when you need to sell, right? If you're like, oh, I need to sell because I want to fund my child's education or I need to sell because I want to pay for um, a wedding or I want to pay for this new house or whatever, like whatever you want to do, like it's fine to sell to live your life. That's, I think the most important time to sell. I think you should be selling if you're trying to do something that's going to help you live your life. So um, those are the three cases I would throw in there. You mentioned Bitcoin. It was reminding me of, of Bill Miller because a lot of the famous investors who are billionaires that we study on this show, I find that the most common trait seems to be that at some point in their career, they were riding some really highly correlated position. And Bill Miller is still doing that. He recently said his portfolio is 50% Amazon, 50% Bitcoin. What are your thoughts on being more concentrated, especially earlier maybe in your life and maybe diversifying later? Yeah. So I think it depends on your goals. This is completely a question about goals. Like if you're trying to become a billionaire, like just keep buying is not going to get you there. Like being a diversified investor, buying over time, you're not going to get there. Like you're going to have to have a concentrated position in assets. You believe it'll go up a ton, whether that means like a business you own, whether that means you're taking these risky bets in these obscure stocks or cryptocurrency or whatever you're doing that's the only way you're going to get there. Like, I'm going to be frank with you. And like, you know, I'm trying to get people to like, just live a decent financial life, the life that they'll like, they don't need to be flying private and all that. If you're trying to get to that level, that's, you need to take a very different set of steps. So I think with like Bill Miller's case, I don't think he cares about, it. I think he just loves the game. Like, I, I don't think his, like, I don't know anything about him. So I'd have no clue. So I can't speak on him, but I think he just loves the, he, he believes in stuff. He's a high conviction person. And he, and he, he follows him and he follows that stuff. And he's one of those people that has skill and he's been demonstrated that skill. So um, yeah, but it's, it's scary to do that. Cause once you're that concentrated, like anything in a big crash, you see like a lot of your money going away very quickly. And so as long as you have a sufficient lifestyle, like, Hey, I want to be able to get to that as no matter what I'm at this lifestyle. That's why I say like sell enough to make sure that you lock in a certain level of lifestyle. And then if you want, let the rest ride above that. And you're like, Oh, I'm only gonna, I want to let the rest ride. Cause I'm either going to be here. Or I'm going to jump a level of like the next, this, you know, flying private, this one, you want to fly private or something, throw that out there. Cause it's like pretty exorbitant. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an exorbitant cost for like compared to first class. Like it's like, it's a, such a big jump for like, I would say not the greatest benefit. Obviously it's like by itself, it's like how much better. I don't know. So that's, that's for, that's another discussion. Well, you also highlight something really interesting by talking about achieving your goals to become spectacularly rich. You might not 
actually ever feel rich. And this is a really interesting point. You know, I recently had this discussion with John Arnold, who at one point in, two, in 2007 was the youngest billionaire in the U.S. And he talked about the experience of feeling the goalposts move. <laughs> you get to millionaire status, you go from 1 million, you want to get to 10. You get to 10 million, you become a billionaire, you want to become a, you know, gazillionaire. So what is your take on why humans experience this? And what are, if any, some ways to reframe wealth, even the relative wealth one might have today versus someone who's in a more impoverished country? Yeah. So I think, I mean, you hit it on the head there with it's, re it's relative, right? Wealth has always been a relative thing and it always will be. And because we don't think in absolutes, it's very hard to realize like how rich you might be already. So the example I give in the book is um, Lloyd Blankfein, who's like the CEO of, uh, the ex-CEO of Goldman Sachs. And he was in an interview and he said, I'm not rich. I'm well-to-do or something. Like you're a billionaire, you're rich. Like no one, there's no one on the planet, no normal person would say you're not rich, right? You know? And so, but Think about his friends, like his best, one of his best friends are like, or I don't know his best friends exactly, but like I see him with David Geffen, Jeff Bezos, like these people have 10, a hundred times his wealth, right? He feels very differently, right? It'd be like if you had a net worth of a thousand dollars or $10,000 and they have a net worth of, you know, a hundred thousand or 10 million, you would feel very differently around these people, right? I mean, so it's interesting to me because he probably feels that way because, you know, it's relative. And so for him to make that argument, like, oh, that's silly. But then I say, okay, well, to be in the top 10% in the world, you only need about $93,000 in wealth. Let's say 100,000 to make it, to round it off. So if you know anyone with over $100,000 net worth, they are richer than 90% of people on the planet, right? That's, and that's, so I would say the top 10% of any sort of thing is like pretty high. That's, you know, at the high end of the distribution. So I would say you're rich, right? And you're like, but Nick, that's not fair. You can't compare me to people in impoverished countries. Like you just said, you can't compare me to them. Well, Lloyd Blankfein is going to make the same argument about you and me. He's going to say, you can't compare me to those normal average people. Like you can't do that. Like, and so like, I get that argument. It's, it's a ridiculous argument, but I get it. And people make the same argument when they're comparing themselves to people in impoverished countries. So it's the same thing. And so I think you have to just you know, say like, Hey, I think how you trick yourself is you have to be like, okay, like look at things on absolute terms and say like, okay, how well off do I really have it? And just be fortunate for that. You know, like I, I'm not a millionaire, but I identify as a rich person of the globe. I identify as rich. And I have to, I think you have to say that to yourself because if you don't, you'll always be chasing the goalposts. And so I mean that in a way, I don't mean that as a bragging thing. There's nothing like that. I mean, that in a way to kind of reorient your mind. So you realize how well you have it in terms of just being in the United States, having the, you know, I don't know, I'm not all your listeners in the United States, but I'm assuming many of them are just like realizing how well you have it relative, how, how things could have been. And so just kind of remembering that, I think it makes you more grateful. And there's a lot of things to think about there. So that's kind of my take on it. And so, yeah, I think a lot of people won't, won't ever feel rich unless you kind of trick yourself into be like, you know what? I actually am already rich. If you look at the data. So I had a similar conversation about this with Morgan Housel when he was on the show and he gave an accolade on your book here in the back. It says, few understand the data and can tell a compelling story about it, like Nick, the must read. And there's something here that Morgan brought up that is resounding with the sentiment you just gave, which is essentially identifying when enough is enough, right? And I think the majority of people, even if they're getting into investing, they don't have the end in mind, right? When they're getting started and you have to actually calculate your cost of living, where you want to be when you retire, how much money you need, et cetera. But one other fact in your book that I thought was really interesting is that it might be less than you expect. And there's data to suggest that post-retirement, people are spending less than they anticipated. Why is that? So, I mean, there's already data showing that retirement spending decreases by about 1% a year. So after 10 years, you should be spending about 10% less than you were when you started. That's one piece. The other thing is um, only about one in six retirees is actually drawing down on their principal. Most are just living off their dividend, like their capital gains and their social security, right? So when you look at that, it's like most people, retirees aren't doing that. You're saying, what about the people that don't have a big portfolio? They're just living on social security. Like they live on what they can get. And so I'm not saying it's the greatest um, lifestyle retirement, but you know, they're living off of it, obviously. So that's the thing is like, you actually look at the data, like a lot of people, they, they have this money and then they just, you know, if they haven't planned on how they're going to spend it, they usually couldn't pull down their principal. Right. So it's kind of, it's wild. And if you look at like, um, uh, bequests, like after people dying, they are leaving inheritances, it goes up like in this people in their sixties, I think the average, like close to 300,000. And then by their seventies, it's a little bit higher and the eighties, a little bit higher. Right. So it's like, people are dying later and just like their wealth keeps growing. And I think one of the, my favorite, uh, 
favorite stats in the books came from a study from Michael Kitsis. He said, if you were using the 4% rule in a 60-40 portfolio, your chance, you're more likely to forex your wealth over 30 years than see your principal drop. So if you start with a million dollars, after doing this, pulling 4% out of a year for 30 years in a 60-40 historically, you're more likely to see that 1 million become 4 million than to be less than a million after after the 30 years. And that's like, what? Like your wealth's going to keep growing. You think like, oh, I'm retired and like I'm pulling money out and then my money's never going to return. Like imagine, you know, you retire in 2015 and then you see like 2017 was a huge return. 2019 was a big return. 2020, despite COVID was a big return. 2021 was a big return. Like your money can keep growing. And that's what I think surprises retirees. They don't, they, they expect the compounding to stop as soon as they hit 65 and it's not true. So interesting. You know, that 30 year timeline you just gave is reminding me of a, another part of the book where it talks about how much luck is a factor. And that's mainly because it is luck when you decide to enter into the market and when you decide to uh, retire, meaning the timeline of the market, the dynamics, all are kind of out of your control, right? So you get to get it out is basically timed on luck. So walk us through why we should think about that, how we should think about it, and how to plan for that. I mean, the thing is you really can't plan for it, unfortunately, right? It's like when you were born, like affects so many things. Like if you were born in 1990, you're going to start investing, you know, around, you know, what is that? 2020 or I guess 2010, 20, yeah, something like that. If you're born in 2000 or investing around 2020, right? So it's like all these things are, that's just how it happens, right? And so obviously over the long run, a lot of these differences kind of, you know, average out a little bit. So that's not as, that's not as, um, as much of a concern, but the best thing you can do is just like, you know, try and have a plan as best you can. And then, you know, react, obviously if something's happening, we're like, oh, Hey, you know, markets, are, we had a bad decade. We'll just, you know, keep buying, you know, focus on other things, focus on your income. But there's a lot of stuff in your control in your life that has nothing to do with markets. So I wouldn't worry as much about markets, but yes, you, you're going to have bad decades. Like we all should have a bad decade at some point. Like I wasn't investing from 2000, 2010 because I was too young to have money, but there will be a decade like that, you know, maybe worse decade. And I'm going to be investing through it. And I can almost guarantee, I doubt I'm going to go start investing in 2012 and just have a, you know, a, a 40 year bear or sorry, bull market's not going to happen. Right. So, you know, you, it's not about, you know, the cards you're dealt, it's about how you play your hand. So you got to think about that, you know, what type of risk you take. And so if, if you just have a good portfolio, that's sufficiently diversified, you have a decent amount of risk control there. I think that's the thing that that's how you really plan for it is by, you know, finding the portfolio and no matter what the world throws at you, you're going to be decently well off. There is one asset class in this book that I know for sure we've never talked about on this show, and that is royalties. And you, you threw out this website, Royalty Exchange. I'd never heard of this. And I looked it up. You can go on there. If you're a musician or someone who has a catalog of songs, you can auction it off and people can buy from you and you can even participate in someone else's royalties by buying someone's catalog, et cetera. I just found this so interesting to be part of the, even a consideration for the allocation, you know, portfolio laid out in the book. Talk to us about what your thoughts are on royalties, how we should think about it and how it plays into our portfolio. Yeah. So I just think it's interesting. I'm a big music fan and I know you are as well, Trey. So it's like one of these things where it's just interesting to think like you could own the royalties on a song. And like, as long as people are listening to that song, like in theory, there's probably some natural decay to a song over time. Um, unless obviously something happened to one of the artists, if one of the artists were to pass or something, you might see a huge surge or something and listen to it. So it's, it's one of those type of things where it's just another type of income producing asset, right? Where it's, it's being produced through streams or played at festivals or whatever it is. So I think it's just cool, just a different type of income producing asset. And I know obviously my book doesn't include every possible income producing asset out there, right? You could be like, I could own you know, vending machines or ATM machine. There's a lot of different things you can own and get yield from in different ways. I just thought it was a cool thing to throw in there because um, I don't I don't plan on doing it anytime soon, but eventually I think that there's a larger buy-in, there's a little bit more fees to get in there. And by the way, I don't have any sort of full disclosure. I have no relationship with Royalty Exchange. I just threw them in there because they're very easy to like look at their site. So uh, no partnership with them. So, but yeah, um, so that's, that's it. I just think it's kind of interesting. I'm big into music and it's just cool to see like, I think the example I gave was, you know, Jay's and Alicia Keys, um, Empire State of Mind, you know, people know that song and like you could buy the royalties and I can't remember exactly the numbers here, but you can go see like, you could have paid this much and you would have got this income stream and assume those royalties are the same every year. This is the yield you would have gotten. It was actually pretty good, right? It's better than like a lot of bonds and things like that. So, you know, question is, are people going to keep listening to music and will taste stay the same going into the future? So now when you have some of these legacy artists retiring or getting older, you see some interesting deals, not that 
you would necessarily participate in them. But for example, I think Bob Dylan sold his early catalog for 300 million. Bruce Springsteen sold his for half a billion. You know, so you, you have access to some, you know, really blue chip art, if you would, you know, categorize it that way. Um, I just found that so interesting, something to keep in mind. You have a quote that I absolutely love, which is that we start out our lives as growth stocks and we end our lives as value stocks. Walk us through what you mean by that. So, yeah, so I, I don't know how much your audience knows about this. I'm guessing they know a fair amount since you talk about stocks, but, you know, just a quick definition, grow stocks are those stocks that everyone has, you know, they're growing a lot. There's a lot of high expectations for the future and people really could pay attention to that growth. If that growth starts to slow, usually the, the price and the value of those stocks comes down. And there's value stocks, which are usually beaten down pretty badly, but usually they're oversold and people think they're not going to do well. And then any sort of upside surprise is good. And that's why generally over the, over history values outperform growth over the long run because these stocks get beaten down and then they out, outperform. Now, of course, recently that's not been true. Value has been getting crushed relative to growth of like the last decade, but the, how it relates to people is that a lot of people, what they do, like, especially in like your early twenties, you'll probably have like all these expectations for yourself. Oh, by the time I'm 30, I'm going to have this and that. And you have all these like dreams for yourself and maybe all of them don't come true. And as a result, people start to kind of, you know, feel bad about themselves and they didn't achieve. But this this happens to everyone. This is not just you. This happens to everyone. It happened to me too. And I give the, the example I give is when I was 30, I said, you know, I want to have half a million dollars by the time I'm 30. And where, where did I get that from? Buffett had a million by the time he was 30. Remember, that's not adjusted for inflation. If you adjust for inflation, it's like 9 million. So I didn't adjust for inflation. And then I cut it in half because I'm not Warren Buffett, right? Like I'll just get to half a billion. And I didn't make it. I just did not even make it to half a million. So I was like down on myself and I was like, Bringing research on this. And this makes sense because like a lot of people have these high expectations for themselves and then you don't meet those expectations and you start to get really down on yourself. So you have this like midlife crisis, you start feeling bad, but then you start getting, you know, a lot of things happen that you don't expect and you get all these upside surprises. So we, we started these growth stocks, the, the expectations don't meet, we kind of start to fall down. We become value stocks, but then there's all these upside surprises as we get older, retirement, you know, whatever that's children, grandchildren, all these sort of things in our lives that surprise us and bring us joy in ways that we never would have expected. And that kind of brings our happiness back up. So it's kind of cool, like the happiness data and kind of relating that to investing and a lot of stuff. So I thought it was like kind of a cool little analogy and you can kind of relate to, you know, I saw in my personal life. So if you see that too, it's, it's very normal, a very normal thing. You mentioned data. I mean, you are strongly driven by data. I'm wondering if that was always the case. You know, it sounds like as you've gone more and more into the data, your conviction level in what you lay out here in the book has gotten stronger and stronger and stronger. Is that how you started out? I mean, I know you studied economics. Have you always been data oriented in that way? Or did you experience something that said, okay, I got to rely more on data here? I think I slowly just became more evidence-based. Like obviously in high school, I don't remember being like this at all. Like obviously I, I know I study and stuff. I wasn't making arguments, right? I think in college when I started making arguments and writing papers and things like that, I just get more and more data oriented. I found this old presentation I gave like my senior year in uh, college. I was like, to my, it was like a writing class and we had to like present something and like, you know, PowerPoint, whatever. And at some point in there, I, I have the video still. And I said, like, if you don't have data, like personally, I think you have nothing. Like I, was, like, I say some crazy stuff like that. And of course, data can be deceptive. You can fix, you can warp numbers to tell all sorts of stories. I know how you can use it. Like I've studied all that stuff too. I know how people, you know, use certain biases, selection bias, things like that. So I know about that stuff. And so data is not a silver bullet. Um, but I like using it because I think there's a lot of stuff that makes intuitive sense to us, but then it's not true. And so, I mean, Simple as example is like the world is the world isn't flat. The world's a globe, right? Where, where it's round, right? So it's like I do not have any personal experience that can prove that. I cannot. Everything, even when I'm in a plane, I'm like the world looks pretty flat to me, right? But I know from experimentation, all these different. There's so much evidence there that it would you'd have to really be like, okay, no, the Earth is still flat. Even though I cannot physically, I cannot prove my eyes that I've seen a, a, the. You know, I haven't been in a space shuttle or anything, right? So because I haven't seen it. It's, that doesn't mean it's right. It, it, the flatness of the earth is intuitive, but the data shows otherwise, right? It's one of those things. That's what it's the whole thing behind data science. We're trying to find the truth, not just what we think feels right. And so I think that's the whole premise of the book is like, I wrote this thing because I'm like, there's a lot of things that intuitively make sense, but when you actually look into the data, it doesn't actually back that intuition. So we're sometimes wrong and that's, that's okay. I'm too often wrong. So uh, I appreciate this book. I really enjoyed it. It's called Just Keep Buying. And it's out now. Where can our audience learn more about you, Nick? I know you have a blog. I'd love for you to share that, where they can find your book and any other resources you want to give out. Yeah, so um, dollarsanddata.com, that's the book. Um, you can find uh, Just Keep Buying on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, like a lot of other retailers should have it. 
Um, and yeah, and just if you want to ask me a question, just DM me on Twitter. My DMs are open. My my handle is at dollars and data, just all one word at dollars and data. If you just search my name, Nick Majuli, um, I'm see you're not gonna be able to spell that. Just copy paste from the show notes or something. <laughs> uh, just do that. You can find me. Feel free to DM me. I, I try to answer every single DM I get. So yeah, happy to hear from people. Well, Nick, this is super fun. Congrats on the book. Uh, been loving your Twitter feed and your blog. I think you are an excellent writer. You cover a lot of things that you don't find elsewhere. I really enjoy it. I'd love to do this again sometime soon. So best of luck with the book and let's have you back. Yes, definitely. Let me know when. When you're in a bubble, where the market top is, whether we're heading into a crisis. I mean, we really don't know. Um, maybe Netflix and Tesla will be up 40% and we'll be laughing at the people that thought it might be a crisis. When the market starts to go down, um, it sometimes continues to go down a lot more.